to start off by saying I thought Hal gave a great talk. We do disagree on this item. There's a lot of controversy in uh, the planetary community about this. Sometimes emotions run high. Um, uh, but Hal is too modest to say what uh, a pivotal figure he has been in the last 20 years in the very thing that he was talking about, the main subject of his talk, which was planet formation. Um, I actually hired Hal when he was a galactic astronomer 20 years ago. And it was actually Gene Shoemaker, 1992, right? And uh, Gene Shoemaker, I think, is the guy that got you interested in planetary science. And uh, uh, Hal has quietly, and sometimes not so quietly, um, revolutionized the field in multiple ways. And some of the biggest discoveries that have happened um, have been, um, uh, they've come out of his computer. Um, in fact, this whole Kuiper Belt revolution is really tremendous. In my book, there are three big revolutions that came out of the discovery of the Kuiper Belt, uh, which uh, Dave Jew and Jane Liu first spotted, or you could say Tom Bell spotted, but didn't know what he had found. Um, one was the geography of the solar system was changed. We realized the outer planets aren't the outer planets, they're the middle planets. There's this whole third zone. It's as if we had had a map of the, of the Earth missing the Pacific Ocean basin, the largest structure. The largest structure in our planetary system is the Kuiper Belt. We didn't know about that. The Kuiper Belt also taught us two very important lessons. One is that from using the object, the orbits the objects in it, forensically, we've been able to pretty much make an open and shut case, tell me if I think you'll agree, that the planets moved around. This was not widely accepted or, for the most part, even in the mind of planetary scientists. Now there's a basically open and shut case that the system is a lot more complicated. The planet migration took place, the planets can switch orbits, they can motorboat out, outward, do angular momentum exchange. Really taught us a whole new paradigm that's turning out to be very important in all those other planetary systems. And the third thing it taught us, which is related to the subject of this talk, is that our solar system is very good at making small planets, and we missed the boat on that because we only knew the tip of the iceberg in the early days. Pluto. So I'm going to talk about planet classification. I was going to do this tomorrow and we'll talk today about space commercialization, but we're just going to flip. So tomorrow I'll talk about space commercialization, and today this is the book into Hal's talk. And um, I want to say uh, that uh, in the opinion of many of us, um, uh, the range of sizes of planets that we're discovering, <coughs> both in our system and in others, where we're discovering new things at the top end and new things at the, at the bottom end, um, is not so surprising. And it really doesn't come to a, um, uh, a point of classification um, in terms of ruling things in and out. And the best analogy I know are the stars. Um, these are relative sizes of known stars uh, in the solar neighborhood. And the dwarf star, called the dwarf star, as you know, a G dwarf, is the sun, which you cannot even see, even maybe from the front row on this scale. They're all stars. We don't debate whether the little ones are, are not stars or they are stars. And that's what really prompts, I think, this classification uh, debate that we've been having in planetary science. I like to make the analogy that if you were a botanist who grew up on a desert island, and the only plants you knew about were the ones on that desert island, you might extrapolate to other places on Earth and say, that's what I will expect. And then when you're presented with a world tour and the great range and diversity of, of, of uh, what life has evolved, you might be shocked. You might even be forced to reclassify. You probably would, because you might think that the only things in the tree of life that are on the, um, in the plant kingdom look like frosts or they look like palm trees. And then you might be forced to ask the question, should I count these other things as life or not? Should I, should I change the paradigm or should I put a fence around what I knew before? And I think that's what's happening in planetary science. Uh, not speaking about how, but I know planetary scientists who said, well, we just can't have large numbers of planets. We'll never remember the names of them. And, and uh, I see people that say, well, those aren't the planets I, I learned about, so we're going to try and classify based upon what we know. I think science is about accepting new data. So I'm going I'm to speak from that point of view. And by the way, I'd like to say that if the current IEU had been around in 1610, 
when Galileo pointed that little telescope up and found an uncountable number of stars, they probably would have found a definition that were most about as stars. Because they have to name them all. And they have to memorize them. Okay, so this has come to the fore. The question of how we're going to organize this great zoo of planets we've discovered. Two big revolutions in observational astronomy have taken place in the same 20 years that Hal Levison has been pioneering all these new theoretical ideas. One is, is that we have been able, through the advance of CCD cameras and modern computers that can churn through the data, to probe the deep outer solar system. Before, we could only see the brightest objects there. And so our views were biased by the fact that we saw the big objects and the brightest things, but we really couldn't tell what else was out there. After all, I think all of you probably know as science journalists that, that as, as, as light goes away from its source, it falls away in intensity like R squared. So if you go twice as far, something's four times different. And four times as far, 16 times different. But in planetary science, it's much worse because the light from the sun has to go out and back. It's reflection. So it's R squared squared or R to the fourth. So you go twice as far out, and now it's two to the fourth times, right? It's 16 times harder. Go three times as far out, right? And it's 81 times harder. So it's a very steep cliff that we've just uh, overcome recently and able to probe the Kuiper belt. In all of our lifetimes, we couldn't see it with the technology of the 70s and 80s. We didn't have the digital cameras and we didn't have the ability to turn to massive data. And at the same time, we've been able to discover extrasolar planets in large numbers. That's the other revolution that's teaching us so much about this one special example here. And both of those things force us to think about planet classification because we were safe at home on our little desert island until the 1990s when both revolutions came on us at the same time. It's coincidental, but it's interesting that the extrasolar planet revolution came about in the early 1990s and mid-1990s, and so did the corporate level. Now, I'm going to cast my talk in terms of this fellow who did a wonderful thing for science, Nicholas Copernicus. We all know about the Copernican Revolution, which was about accepting new data and changing your paradigm. And so you'll see his visage come up a few times. I'm going to start this talk way back in 1930 with this picture of the entire American Astronomical Association. How many of you have ever been to a AAS meeting? Not very many. Okay, so there are differences in the AAS today. Um, Al pointed one of them out uh, during the break. Um, it's pretty gender neutral now. It wasn't then. In fact, more graduate students are women than men now in planetary science and astronomy, as I understand it. Um, other differences were really dressed funny back then. And there weren't very many of them. And you go to a, a AAS meeting today, and people are pretty much dressed like we were in the room, and there are thousands of people at the meeting. It's a much bigger field. But back in 1930, this was the view of the solar system. There were only two types of planets. There were the four rocky terrestrial planets on the inside, the four giant planets on the outside. All the planets travel in nice circular orbits in the same plane. And they were all believed to orbit where they were born. Thanks to the discoveries in extrasolar planets and in our own solar system, we now know that all four of these facts that were bedrock in 1930 are wrong. All four. This is what it looked like before 1930. If you drew um, a diagram of the solar system, and you can see, is there a pointer? Did you have one? No, I didn't. No, which is All right. So, so I got one for you. Somebody got one? Yep. Yeah, so the difference was I could reach. And I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Never be for that one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so there's the, there's the grouping. This is a log log plot. Log distance on the axis of log mass on the orbit. These are the four terrestrial planets that are grouped down in close around 1 AU, ranging from Mercury out to Mars. And then a much higher mass assemblage out here, the four uh, so called giant planets. And the reason that our ideas were naive is because we were so data limited. We could only see what was close and bright, and this is all they could find. Until the year 1930, when this geography changed. Instead of four terrestrial planets and four giant planets, 
along with comets and asteroids that have been known for a long time. This guy is discovered. This is about the same time that Fermi was saying uh, about the, the discovery of the neutrino. Who ordered that? Same thing. Who ordered that? Here's a low mass planet far out. And the people who found it at Lowell Observatory looked and looked and looked for a long time. And others did as well, thinking they would find, if they found this one, they would find another, and maybe another. And at the time, they thought this was a giant planet because they didn't have a good handle on its size. But in fact, all their searches in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s yielded nothing in that region or further out. They didn't have the technology to see what we later could see. So they kept thinking Pluto is a misfit. It doesn't fit the paradigm. What's that odd thing? What's that footnote? Right? Of course, one of the revolutions of the Kuiper Belt is that we now have the context for this first discovered object. So this is much brighter on my screen. So I apologize. This is a view looking down on the solar system showing the orbits of uh, the giant planets, that's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, Kuiper Belt objects are plotted as red dots and white dots, and blue dots for asteroids in much closer. Now, when you look at this diagram, it shows there are a lot of these guys. If you look more closely, you'll see some structure. Most of the structure that you see is just observational artifact. This gap isn't a gap on in the Kuiper Belt. It's just the, the direction of the galactic center. And any, any of you who look at Sagittarius know that you don't want to bother looking there. That's the hardest place you could possibly look because it's the densest star fields. You have to deal with confusion looking at all those stars um, against the field where you're looking for faint Kuiper Belt. Rocks. So people don't, people in their right mind don't look there. Actually, the New Horizons team is looking there because it just turns out that's where we're going. So we have to find our Kuiper Belt targets in the hardest part of it. The, the Kuiper Belt observation. Also, if you see these radial structures that look like fingers, they're not structure in the Kuiper Belt. They're the results of individual observing runs where a team will make multiple discoveries looking along the line of sight. Okay? So there's really, to zero order, it's a smooth disk-like distribution. And in that distribution, as Hal said, there are astronomical numbers of tiny guys, things the size of comets, things the size of let's say counties, or a kilometer across, very small. But also, as, as Hal described, we discovered that the solar system made a whole new class of planet that we didn't really expect. There were some papers before the discovery of the Kuiper Belt, the one I coined the term dwarf planet in, is one of those, which looked at some circumstantial evidence that there ought to be more of these in large numbers, about a 1,000 of them. And as Hal, Hal said, and as I'm pointing out in this diagram, um, we have absolute incontrovertible evidence that there are large numbers of small planets, or whatever you want to call them, out there now. Actually, this little collection, this is an old slide, so some of these now have uh, names. Um, some of them have more satellites that are shown. They're shown to scale with each other, except this one um, is actually been discovered to be essentially the size of two of them. Within a percent or so, we can't tell the difference in their sizes. Um, this is Eris. And the colors as shown are the colors and roughly the albedos as best we know. And if this was up to date, Pluto would have five moons and there'd be other changes. But the big picture point I want to make is that we've discovered large numbers of these small planets, or whatever you want to call them. Now, there is a common misconception, and some of the press, the less scientifically literate press at least, gives the impression that Pluto and these other planet-sized objects are really tiny things. And I know because I go to grade school and give talks. People somehow think we're talking about ornaments on a Christmas tree. The size of these things are tiny. They are not. Actually, this is an artist's conception of Pluto. I'll get you something better in about three years. <laughs> to scale with all the asteroids we've ever flown by, even the ones that are 100 kilometers plus across, except for the most recent, which is Vesta, which is half the size of Sharon, or something like that. I think it's even smaller than that. 
Okay, but these are really large objects. I alluded to the fact that if you drove around Pluto's equator, it's the distance from Manhattan to Moscow or from Manhattan to Honolulu. So please help solve that little problem in, in science communication. These are large objects. Now, so what sets the small planets apart from the large ones? Well, they're smaller. Okay, that's pretty obvious. I'm smaller than Hal. But as he said, he's a man. I'm a man. Doesn't really make a difference. Oftentimes, and this is often used by some individuals in this debate, those guys have orbits that are more elliptical and more inclined than the large planets in our solar system. Absolutely true. But it's not a, a, a characteristic of the objects. It's a characteristic of where they are. Because they're so far from the sun, the binding energy to the sun is much smaller. So the same kind of random velocity in their orbit that we see in the orbits of the inner planets produces a bigger eccentricity and inclination just by dint of where they are, not what they are. And that's oftentimes also miscommunicated or not understood by journalists. So I'll keep talking. How can defend? How can defend his point of view after? Well, no, that's a scientific. That's not. A, that's that's certainly absolutely not the case. If you take the the random velocity of the Earth in its orbit, and you put Earth with the same random yeah, velocity at 30 AU, its eccentricity would be yeah, like that's Pluto's. not how dynamics works. That's an empirical <laughs> fact. But it's the wrong. This gentleman. My question was, what is random velocity? Okay, let me, let me not use a jargon term, okay? The eccentricity of an orbit is caused uh, by um, a, a, a variation in speed from the circular orbit you would get if the orbit were not eccentric. And that's termed by dynamicists and planetary scientists as the random velocity of the orbit. Okay. So, so what, it really, what we're really saying is if you took the Earth's orbit with, and you measured that that random velocity, that amount of non-circular velocity, and put that on an object at 30 astronomical units, any object, because the Kepler speeds, the orbit speeds around the sun are so much lower, that would amplify the eccentricity that you can see as you saw. And I could do that as arithmetic on the board, but I don't want to get bogged down in my talk. I'm still in the early stages, so let me go a little faster. If you look at what these objects have in common, the ones that we're discovering in the Kuiper Belt, with the other planets that we already know about, um, there are lots of things they have in common. They are believed to have formed the same way as the terrestrial planets, formed by the binary accretion of objects that, that builds them up, as Hal was talking about. They're made of rock and ice, the same thing as, as uh, the conventional inner planets. They have many have moons, like other planets. Um, they're believed to have cores, like the larger planets. Some have atmospheres, just like the larger planets. Their, their surfaces are solid, just like the terrestrial planets. And they are expected to have active surface geology and tectonics. And in fact, there's one of these planets that we've actually visited. It's called Triton. It used to orbit the sun on its own, but was captured into orbit around Neptune. And Voyager 2 went right by it and saw this kind of geological activity. So simply put, if you look at the attributes of the objects of these Kuiper Belt planets, they have all these same distinguishing characteristics and no real differences from the larger planets, except for one. They're smaller. That's it. On an attribute basis, there is no distinguish, they're just a smaller class. It's, it's like we discovered those pygmies on some island, you know, back in the 17th century, still part of the human race. Just we didn't know about that before. And something similar is going on here. Um, I like to say, you know, a chihuahua is still a dog because it has deep innate characteristics that cause us to classify it as a dog, even though know, it's this tiny little thing. And since 1992, it's true, this guy's um, uh, part of this revolution. It's a Copernican revolution in changing our view of the solar system and what planets are. It came about because of the discovery of the Kuiper Belt. Way down here. So is our view of the population of the solar system. We used to think of it as the four terrestrial planets, the four giant planets, and misfit Pluto. 
But now we know, along with comets and asteroids, but now we know that, that census was completely wrong. I don't think there's any debate that there are four terrestrial planets, four giant planets, and about a thousand dwarf planets. They're the ones that are the norm. Who's the misfit now? It's the weird giant terrestrial planets and the weird even more giant gargantuan gas giants that are in small numbers that don't really fit. They just happen to be close so we can see them with primitive technology. So we thought that's the way it was, but it's not the way it was. And interestingly enough, we've seen similar things, similar kinds of brain twisting changes in our view of what planetary systems are when we look at the extrasolar planets. As most of you know, the first extrasolar planet was detected in 1993 um, by radio techniques around a pulsar right away. That was bizarre. And over the years, uh, through radio velocity and now the techniques of, of uh, planetary transits, we've been discovering more and more objects. And thanks to Kepler, this NASA mission, um, the numbers have skyrocketed way beyond this early graph built in 2007. And with those discoveries, we've seen more and more examples of who ordered that, of things we completely didn't expect. Hot Jupiters. How will tell you, hot Jupiters have completely revolutionized the way that we think about the architectures of solar systems and the way that solar systems evolve over time. No one that I know of predicted hot Jupiters before one was discovered. Pulsars with planets, nobody expected that planets could survive in close to stars that went supernova. And yet, in several pulsar systems, we see not only a planet, but multiple planets. There are lots of planets being discovered on eccentric and inclined orbits. Very different from our solar system. That doesn't mean that they're not the same kind of object. It just means that the only example we had was a narrow section through the true diversity of planetary systems. We're seeing super-Earths and even objects, large objects with the density of balsa wood that no, no one would have expected. The crowded little inner solar system that Hal talked about with eight large objects inside of Mercury's orbit. And again and again, almost every year, there's some completely mind-bending example of, we didn't expect that. We didn't expect that. So we're seeing it both in our own solar system and in these other systems. And it's because we're getting better data. So we have to readjust. That's my view. We have to readjust to the new facts. So what's the message here? The diversity of planetary types, both far and near, is exploding before our eyes. Host stellar orbital compositional atmospheric types, as well as planetary size, range over a much wider parameter space than we knew about when most of us learned about the geography of our solar system. Because the technology has allowed us to now see what we can see. And as a result, our own Earth has been further displaced as a typical kind of planet. We're seeing, we're seeing that all the time. But for some, it's a problem. This is a picture from the Prague IAU meeting. Um, when, uh, with little warning, an organization made up mostly of astronomers, not planetary scientists. People, un unlike Hal, who's, who's a, a giant in the field in every respect. <laughs> Most people in the IAU are about as close to planetary scientists as a divorce lawyer is um, a tax lawyer. They don't really know the subject. And on very short notice, they decided to go and uh, work up a definition to keep the number of planets small. They did a very poor job of it. And I think Copernicus if he, if, uh, would be smiling if he could see this. It's really, I think, anti-Copernican revolution. I debated Mike Brown once on Ira Flato's Science Friday. This is a Caltech professor who said, we can't have 50 planets because my daughter won't be able to remember the names of them. So my retort was, well, Mike, I guess we're going to have to go back from 50 to 8 states, too. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about the IU definition, which everyone agrees is bad. But I'm going to completely deconstruct it for you. It's got three parts. By the way, the IU had a working group which came up with the definition that a planet would be a celestial object in space 
that has sufficient mass so that it assumes the hydrostatic equilibrium I was talking about. And that committee, which I was not on, uh, passed that and took it forward to the IAU and a little cabal, what did you call it? Cabal? Something. Oh. Just a, decided that they would like to, to involve dynamics in the definition. And so they said it should also have cleared its neighborhood around its orbit. Let's talk about that. There are lots of ways to talk about that. I don't want to talk about the trivial ways, like, you know, they're near Earth asteroids, so the Earth hasn't cleared its orbit. It's a little sloppy on the part of what was done in Prague, but, but look, we know what they were getting at. They, these are new objects that are feeding in all the time in the Earth asteroids. And the Earth could clear that zone. But the problem that I have with this is that it produces completely illogical results that are completely contradictory. The IU definition. So first problem I have with it is that it has nothing to do with the attributes and the nature of the body. Secondly, and worse, if you work out what it means to clear a system, it depends on a lot of parameters. Some of them are just constants, like the gravitational constant, but it depends on the age of the system as to what zones are cleared. The older the system, the more time objects have to clear their zone. It depends upon the mass of the star, so you'll get different results. You'll have different classifications of identical objects in different stellar systems. I think that's a bad definition. But worst of all, it's biased against things at large distance. And you can understand that intuitively without any math by just getting this. As you go further out, the volume of the zones is going up, like the distance cubed. So you have to clear a lot more space. So there's an automatic bias. It's complicated further by the fact that the orbit speeds are slower. So you get around your zone more slowly. And you just can't clear it in time. So objects that would classify as planets in inner solar systems, you put the identical object out there, and it will not classify in outer solar systems. I think that's a really terrible way to go about defining things. It's not only going to be different from star to star, but it's completely contradictory to our normal intuition that identical objects should classify identically. So I let's... Is it, I, just, I just had one question. I mean, the IAU never intended that definition to apply to all solar systems only for this one. Yes. Yeah, that was stupid too. That was stupid <laughs> 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 So if I took the Earth, and put it out, say, at the orbit of... We're going to do this right now. This is Hal's diagram. It's, it's a great diagram. He drew it for me. And it shows uh, two criteria by which you can clear zones. Clearing by scattering, which means a close flyby, or by, by objects of accreting, and therefore sucking up all the feedstock in their zone. And, and the way to read this graph is really easy. If it's above, um, above the lines that you see here, either line, it, it'll clear its zone by one mechanism or another. And these are the actual masses and distances of the, the nine planets in our solar system. Those are the green dots, the nine that we started with. I like to say, don't think nine, think 900. So Mercury is above this line, and therefore it can clear its zone. And so is the Earth, the Venus and the Earth, and Mars and so forth. And you get all the way out here, and Pluto is below both lines, so it doesn't clear the zone. It's too low a mass clear the zone. Now, the zone clearing is premised on oh, having a criteria by which you can limit the number of planets. But let's, let's see what would happen in, in a, a thought experiment. This red cross is the Earth. If you put the Earth at Pluto's distance from the Sun, it would not classify as a planet. So think about this. Just as a thought experiment. Nine orbits Mercury through Pluto, and you line up an Earth in every one. And the first six will classify by the IAU definition as a planet, and the three others, identical objects, will not, simply because of where they are, their location. Because they're further out, the zone clearing is harder, and therefore an Earth mass object won't classify. Now, does that mean that if Pluto were moved to where Mercury is, and if Pluto were moved in sufficiently, that would happen. It would be a planet. Yeah. Yeah. You can move, I, I don't know about Mercury's orbit, but you can pick a distance at which any given object you can move in, right? Now, I claim that any definition that precludes an Earth mass object from being a planet is inherently flawed. Because we all agree that this is a planet. 
aside from the ridiculousness, aside from the ridiculousness that identical objects classify differently. And so, as the originator of the term dwarf planet, I'm also the originator of the Star Trek test. I don't think it's really that hard. So let me show you the IAU's 23rd century. Kirk and Spock show up and orbit around some planet. The commercial break is over. They come back. What always happens happens. They turn on the viewfinder. What happens out in, in TV land? Within about one second, everyone in TV land knows whether they're orbiting a star or an asteroid or some alien spaceship or a planet or a comet. You know it instantly. It's not very hard to do. But not in the IAU 23rd century. In the 23rd century IAU world, Kirk turns to Spock and says, Mr. Spock, what is that? And Spock says, not sure yet, Captain. I'm going to have to survey the entire population of the system, find out every object here. Then I'm going to have to integrate their orbits and determine which ones are capable of clearing their zones of the vacuum. All right. Actually, by the universe, you should take the <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So many of us in the planetary science community think this is dark. It's, it's, it's one of the hallmarks of good science is that it's internally self-consistent, that it doesn't present immediate contradictions. And yet we have identical objects that will classify differently in this scheme. So we like something else called the geophysical planet definition. And what does it say about planet definition? It's a celestial body that has sufficient mass so that it can assume hydrostatic equilibrium, be nearly round. Because gravity will overwhelm material strength, it knows it's big. It's not like this table or this building or the flat irons out there where material strength will always dominate the gravity. It's big enough that it will flow into the shape of the sphere. And it, let's not count everything that's above this boundary because if it has too much mass, it becomes something else, a star. So it also has to have an upper limit. So the object is trapped between the lower size criteria and upper. So it has to have insufficient mass to initiate sustained fusion in its interior. Because above that boundary, we call it a star. I think this is a really good definition. For one thing, it's parallel to the definitions that we use in other ways in astronomy. You know, classifying stars is really based upon just gravity. When there's enough mass, the gravity of that mass increases the central temperature in the object enough to eventually ignite fusion. And this is very similar. Um, and that's one of the things that I like about it, but it's also internally consistent. And I like attribute-based definitions, and we use them all the time. Um, take this kind of object, um, a house or a home. Do we judge whether an object is in an urban setting or in a group or off by itself? The definition of a house is a place where people live. It usually includes at least a sleeping room. Based on attributes. And we do the same thing in astronomy. Stars are not classified whether they are in a galaxy or not in a galaxy. Whether they're in groups and packs like a cluster or not. Whether they're binary or not. Same is true for galaxies. We don't care if a galaxy is in a cluster or off by itself. If it's undergoing a collision and there's a tight bound orbit with another, it's never based on location. Location works really well in real estate. It doesn't work so well in astronomy. And what the IU balled up was an issue of location with what ought to be an issue of attributes. So you ask, if we have the geophysical planet definition, where is the dividing line? Where, what objects in our solar system count as planets and which don't? It turns out you can calculate from first principles where the hydrostatic equilibrium occurs. It does depend upon some factors. So it's not just based upon mass, it's also based on the equation of state, what something's made of, a little bit, not so much. But the boundary is more or less down here in terms of radius, a few hundred kilometers. More dense, a little less, less dense, a uh, little bigger. But you see many common objects in our solar system, and the, the code here, it, um, is enumerated here. If it has just a number, that's which planet it is in our solar system. Planet 5 is Jupiter, planet 6 is Saturn, 7 is Uranus, there's Neptune. Um, if it has a, a letter out front, that's which satellite of a planet, Jupiter's second known satellite. Uh, uh, 
Jupiter's first known satellite, Io, etc. The 11 and the 12 and the 14 are big asteroids. And Pluto is far above this boundary, and so are the other large corporate belt objects. Now, there's an argument you will sometimes hear, and you heard it this morning, that we want this clean definition when there's a break and there's never any shades of gray. I used to want that too when I was 18. But I later learned that there's shades of gray in everything. And the geologists deal with it in uh, uh, hills versus mountains, rivers versus streams. Uh, the biologists deal with it, the oceanographers deal with it in their classification systems. We in planetary scientists, I submit, need to get over the fact that there's going to be an arbitrary boundary somewhere. There are always going to be objects that are on the borderline. There are always going to be near misses to what classifies and what doesn't, simply because the number of objects we're dealing with is, well, astronomical. And the range of examples that we're seeing keeps growing. So what the geophysical planet definition does for you is that it's simple, it's intuitive, it's much less ambiguous. It embraces the diversity of planetary systems that we're discovering. It doesn't rely on having a complete census of the system. And objects don't reclassify based upon their orbital location. Even if they're in orbit around a star or not, doesn't matter to the geophysical planet definition. <clears throat> or whether a planet orbits a planet. That's perfectly fine, just like stars orbit stars. We can have binaries, trinaries, it doesn't matter. It's based upon what you see, what the object is. And with the geophysical planet definition, an object of Earth mass will always classify as a planet. And I think that's a key thing pedagogically, in addition to just plain making sense. So, I'm gonna close here. If you use the geophysical planet definition today, it gives a census of about 20 objects orbiting the sun, two-thirds of which are dwarfs. Like I said, we didn't used to know the dwarfs dominated the population. We do today. These are the objects that classify by the geophysical planet definition as planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the four giants, and these guys in the Quaker Belt. This is actually an old list, there are a couple more now. And in addition, because the geophysical definition never speaks to location, Satellite planets qualify, so objects like Io and Europa and Ganymede and Callisto qualify. They are planets that orbit other planets. Yes, they are also moons. They are also satellites, just as I'm a human being, but I also can be subdivided as an American, which is about my location. Right? And being a satellite is about your location, not about what you are, but where you are. I think that science is about discovering new paradigms. And so I will leave this debate to you. Not by voting, but by each person making up their own mind what you think is the better way to classify climate. That's the way this is really gonna happen. It's not gonna be by voting in committees, but it's gonna be individual by individual, scientist by scientist, coming to their own conclusion for which is the better scheme. And I think with that, I'll stop and I'll take your questions. Thank you.